And once again, we have some really exciting discoveries coming from our neighbor, the Moon. Some discoveries quite unexpected, others quite thought-provoking, and some discoveries still don't really make much sense. But all of them, for the most part, quite intriguing. And so, hello wonderful person, this is Anton. Let's discuss the Moon, let's talk about what was actually found here, and let's start with that first unusual discovery in regards to something that's really important for our survival. Water. Although I guess not liquid water, as much as water ice and a lot of deposits inside the lunar regolith. And for many decades now, it's been officially known that there is definitely a lot of water hiding on the Moon. As a matter of fact, one of the recent missions by the Korean Dunry Pathfinder Orbiter was able to use its extremely accurate Shadowcam camera in order to reveal hidden deposits inside a lot of lunar craters, discovering huge amounts of elements inside of them, including the abundance of important elements like oxygen, iron, calcium, aluminium, and even titanium, all of them hidden inside of these craters, accumulating in them for billions of years. But one of the major purposes of this mission essentially being identification of most important craters that might hide the most potential deposits of water. And that's of course because a lot of different mapping missions have already established certain locations that seem to have high amounts of water, with others potentially having relatively low amounts. But the biggest question before was of course, why? Why is there even water present here? And is there any connection to planet Earth? And turns out that the answer is most likely yes. Earth seems to be directly responsible for all of this water on the surface of the Moon. But maybe not in the way that we think. The water is not coming from Earth, it's sort of coming from the Sun. And specifically, the solar wind. All of these emissions are releasing huge amounts of hydrogen, and specifically hydrogen ions, into outer space, which then bombards the surface of the Moon, converting a lot of stuff on the surface as it interacts with all of these ions. And in many cases, it ends up forming water one atom at a time. And all of this water gets deposited into the regolith and eventually stays on the surface for millions and even billions of years. Which is exactly why certain locations seem to have quite a lot of it. But the problem is that, well, it wasn't really clear if Earth has any other effects. And specifically because of the Earth's magnetosphere. We know that the Moon passes through the magnetosphere, and specifically through the magnetotail, pretty much every 30 days and it stays inside of the tail for at least a few days. And during this time, it's actually expected that maybe something is going to be changing on the surface of the Moon, because we know that the magnetosphere of planet Earth protects us from the solar wind and generally creates conditions where a lot of plasma around planet Earth essentially gets concentrated into a kind of a plasma sheet and eventually expelled into outer space. But the problem in this case is that I guess sometimes the Moon does pass through some of these plasma sheets, and also seems to interact with Earth in some other ways. Because as the researchers behind this paper recently discovered, it turns out that the formation of water on the surface of the Moon is not prevented by the magnetotail, but instead seems to be encouraged by it through some kind of an interaction with various electrons potentially trapped here as well. Although in this case the mechanism right now is not clear, but what is clear is of course the fact that the Earth's magnetosphere most likely affects the chemistry on the surface of the Moon. And so the magnetic tail from the planet is most likely responsible for forming huge amounts of water right behind it. But that of course raises another really intriguing question. Is there any chance that this mechanism was also responsible for somehow bringing the water back to planet Earth? In other words, when Earth was much younger and had a much more powerful magnetosphere, and also when the Moon had one as well, could this unusual interaction have enriched the planet with the water we have on the surface. And that's of course because we still have no idea where exactly Earth got its water from. For many years it was believed to be asteroids or comets, but all of the analysis to date suggests that that's not the case. The asteroids and comets examined to date all possess different isotope composition when it comes to water. But by comparing water molecules on the Moon with the water molecules on Earth, we might finally be able to resolve this unusual mystery. Maybe just maybe, the water on the Moon and the water on Earth came from the same source, each other, via the unusual interactions of the magnetosphere and the enrichment through the magnetotail. That's of course a huge speculation, 
but all of the evidence for this will most likely be collected once we finally go back to the moon. And so, at least for now, we're pretty certain that Earth is definitely responsible for some of the water formation. But when it comes to these future missions, water is of course one of the most important resources we're currently trying to find. And that's despite the fact that we now have a very, very detailed map, geological map, of the surface of this beautiful object. You can learn more about this in one of the videos in the description. And one of the more intriguing ways of potentially extracting all of this is actually by using mirrors. Redirecting sunlight at a very specific spot in order to form ice sublimation, extract water vapor, and then potentially start turning it into liquid or maybe even some kind of a fuel. Basically by turning water into hydrogen and oxygen. Which at least in theory sounds like a pretty good plan and would technically work pretty well. But relatively recently someone performed an experiment trying to see if this actually would work on the moon. Here they used fake moon rocks, a large mirror to try to direct sunlight, and a transport system in order to capture water as it escapes from the surface. And though at first it was working just fine with the water being extracted, at some point the reaction became very inefficient. And turns out that it's actually because it seems to form a sort of a dry layer on top that creates a thermal barrier trapping the water underneath, basically preventing the water from escaping once the surface dries out enough. And so at the moment this creates a bit of a problem. Even though in theory we could be able to apply this on the moon, it's quite likely that the actual effect is going to be very similar. It's going to extract some water from the surface, but everything underneath is going to be trapped completely because of that dry layer on top. So something else has to be done in order to make this more efficient. But figuring out these efficient mining methods and making them work on Earth first is of course how all of this is going to start and how at some point it's going to be used on the moon. Although when it comes to the surface of the moon, something really strange was discovered relatively recently by looking at the old seismic data, the data from moonquakes. Now based on a lot of different missions, including of course various Apollo missions that left a lot of different sensors on the surface, we know that the moon has moonquakes. But a lot of them are actually based on the time, while others are based on the tidal effects from planet Earth. And what's really intriguing is that the thermal moonquakes are basically the result of the solar radiation. Because the sun heats up the crust here to something like 120 degrees Celsius or 250 Fahrenheit, with the temperature then reduced to minus 133 Celsius, minus 208 Fahrenheit, this results in huge amounts of contraction and expansion that usually occurs very fast. That leads to moonquakes. And actually regular moonquakes during daytime and nighttime at pretty much exactly the same time. But that same data from Apollo 17 discovers something else nobody expected. A very different type of a moonquake coming from the exact location where the mission landed. And turns out that it's actually coming from the lander itself. Now these are not large moonquakes, but they're basically a result of the lander expanding just a little bit once again because of the heat and then sort of vibrating and oscillating on the surface, creating miniature moonquakes once again. Or not really moonquakes as much as just vibrations detectable by these sensors. And though this might not sound very important, it is actually a huge discovery for future lunar missions. It means that we have to be very careful exactly what we make future bases out of. If they're made from the same material as these lenders, or essentially alloys, they're going to experience very similar contraction and expansion and potentially even damage the structure over time. This was not known up until recently. And so instead some sort of a composite material has to be used in order to produce structures that would not experience contraction and expansion. Otherwise it might completely break the structure over time. Which is of course really important for us to know as we begin this new lunar race. More and more countries joining in, trying to land on the moon and even trying to establish permanent locations. With the NASA's Artemis mission most likely being the first in the next few years. And so at least for now, those are some of the new discoveries about the moon and various new discoveries coming from its surface. We'll definitely come back and talk more about this in some of the future videos, especially as we get closer to that final mission launch and the return of humanity to the moon. And so until future videos, check out some of the previous videos on a similar topic in the description below. Thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support the channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. 
Stay wonderful. I'll see you tomorrow. And as always, bye-bye.